Hey there, Carlin from Vitality and Performance, and today we're going to go through the deadlift. Um, please, it's going to be an elaborate video, so make use of the timestamps. If you click below the video on YouTube, you will see a full list of timestamps for the spots that you are interested in. Uh, you can click on there and it jumps straight to that point. Yeah, so I'm going to add a lot in this video. Um, for instance, the, the intro, obviously, the setup starts with the first pull. The, the following pulls and all the details that are uh, involved breathing, bracing, neurological pathways, uh, neurological cues, do's and don'ts, uh, external cues and biofeedback ways to uh, improve your technique, uh, warm up tips, shoes, as well as a list of different types of deadlifts to work with. Right, so let's get started. Why the deadlift? A lot of people are afraid of it, although the most common injury is the lower back. Why? Because a lot of people don't train it regularly. Think about people help someone move or uh, they start gardening beginning of the year before summer hits and they hurt their back. Why? Because they don't practice proper technique. Plus the body's not used to doing it all the, regularly, all the time. It's made to pick something up. Um, because we don't do it all the time, we do generally go for the easiest energy saving method. And that is taking the shortest, simplest route. Because we usually, if we pick something up, it's lightweight. So you see, the most energy efficient manner is actually rounding the back. Like picking up a shoe, yeah, a drop of pen, and thus you do not get um, accustomed to heavier weights and do not focus on proper technique for heavy weights. So, when you do pick up something heavy, help someone with a couch or a couple of bags of soil uh, in springtime to play and work in the garden, then you pick up that heavy stuff with the round back as well. One, the system is not used to it. To the technique is not good. Yeah, it can be a lot better. That's one of the reasons why I advise everyone to do at least one type of deadlift variation once a week. At least once a week. More is good, but at least once a week, weekly, regularly, all year round. You can think of maybe uh, a couple of weeks per year that you don't do it, besides the deload weeks that we program into. Uh, all our training, so after four or five, maybe six weeks, depending on the person and the level, you sit put in a deload week, which consists of either everything at 55% or something totally different, and a few times a year, nothing, just a full break. Break for central nervous system, attachments, ligaments, uh, bones, muscles, as well as the mental drive. Yes, so a couple of reasons um, why deadlift. So the muscles that are involved is generally speaking the posterior chain. Posterior chain is basically from the cranium all the way down to the heels, everything involved in picking things up. Now there are other muscles involved besides the calves, hamstrings, glutes, lower back, the rectus spina, the bigger back and the upper back muscles as well as the neck muscles. The biceps also tend to get used quite a bit but they should be used less than you often see. I'll get back to that later in the video. But also a hell of a lot of core work and not just abs but all around. So the breathing and the bracing once again as with most exercises is a very important aspect that I'll cover thoroughly as well in this video. Right, first let's start with the, the basic setup. A lot of people think, yeah, just have the shoulder width. With the deadlift, that's probably fine. With the squat, we have a specific test that personalizes your uh, foot width according to your upper leg bone length, hip width, and hip socket depth. But for the deadlift, that's not as specific. So you can think of what's my comfortable stance, or you can think of, and this is a very simple one. What's your jumping stance, your jumping position? For that, I've got a uh, stand position. So I can see that this is my 
preferred position. As you progress, you can think of tweaking that position. For some people, that might even mean that the right foot's toes are slightly slumped uh, outwards. Let's go a lot further. Um, now, remember that the basic jump position is important. Your hands should be outside your legs with this variation. Because if the arms go against the knees, chances are you're going to let the knee cave in, which weakens your chain of movement. Rather not. So if you notice that you've got a preference hand position, but you're still rubbing against the knees with your arms, either move your hands wider or put your feet slightly narrower. Then grip. You have a couple of basic grip options. With this, you have the double overhand, where the thumb is over index and middle finger. You have the hook grip. This feels very, very weird, but once you get used to it, you'll never go back. Literally, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, as soon as someone that's used to deadlifting a lot, they will prefer this. Generally, it goes automatic because you can carry a lot longer, and that's because the bar generally was rolled out. But with this, it can't roll out because the thumb is in the way. So that's double overhand hook grip. Then you have the optional switch grip. Now the hook grip and the switch grip will both be weird, so I always advise people to play with them a lot so the body can go through the adaptations with regards to the ligaments as well as the psychology of it because it feels weird, it feels uncomfortable, it might even feel painful. It's not because nothing is tearing as long as you don't force it and you build it up gradually, which is applicable to all trade. So to go further on with the grip option, so you have the switch grip, another option is chalk, very simple, or liquid chalk. Now most gyms don't like the chalk because it gets messy, I get that. So you can think of um, a liquid chalk, you mix it, shake it up, you can buy this at Bakerfield or basically any other good sports shop or climbing and uh, bouldering shop. Couple of just a few drops, two or three drops, and put it on there. Rub it all over where you're going to use it. So that means the inside of the hand, you're going to go hook grip a little bit on top of the thumb, nail, and that section of the skin as well. It's fine too. Now, with this for Olympic lifts, that's very important, but you can use this for all other kinds of hanging and pulling stuff as well. Really makes a difference. You try it out. Uh, people are always shocked. And how much more they can pull once they use a chalk. Remember, you only have a certain amount of focus, so if you have 100% focus but you get distracted by not being able to hold your grip, you're losing focus on the rest of your technique and power output, so your train is less efficient. So, the less you get distracted by your loss of grip or anything else around you, um, the more efficient you can train and the safer you can train. Right, so grip, then breathing. Uh, I elaborate on this quite nicely at the end of the push-up video as well as a, a separate video, go have a look for now. Breathe down to the stomach, brace before you initiate the pull, really important. Uh, you have different breathing variations with that. So for beginners, I advise you stand, breathe, brace, it's not going to heavy yet. Breathe down the stomach through open mouth, brace, push the hips back, bend the knees, take the weight over, and pick it up. Then at the top, and so you go on. So that's the, the grip, the breathing, the brace. And with the first pull, you'll see a lot of people that are uh, that have done a lot of deadlifts, they'll, they'll just get in position, and this is why I advise them well, get in position. See where you want your hands to be. Don't spend too much time under. You'll see really advanced lifters stand like this for a while. That's really advanced. Those are, that's years and years and years. Don't go there as yet. So this is for uh, beginners, intermediate to advanced. And um, the guys that sit at the bottom before they pull, that's super advanced, yeah, that's competitive level. 
So it takes a while to get there. So the breathing and bracing options, you can feel which muscles you want to activate. Then the three basic moving options is what I advise beginners. A little bit more advanced when you're stronger and you're used to feeling where you should feel it. You can get in position and then push the hips up a little bit, make them a little bit more space. And then once again, the more advanced will actually stay at the bottom for a bit. Yeah, to give you a side view of the three options because they do look quite differently. Breathe out the stomach as you're activating. Let it go. More advanced. Even more advanced. Right. So that's breathing and embracing the pressure. Then taking the weight over. Something that I miss a lot with a lot of people, they'll do a drip movement. <laughs> you want to think of breathing, bracing, being fully focused and creating momentum with some things helps to be able to push a person or uh, slam a ball back. You want to think of momentum. But that extra momentum in a pool like this is not the best thing to do. So what I advise with that is to literally take over the weight of the bar. Slight extra rotation in the arms, that means the elbows pulls back, shoulder blades retract and go together. But to practice that, especially as a beginner, to get used to it, you want to make a habit of it, use a thinner bar with big plates, so you can hear it and feel it. Biofeedback, audio feedback, and for the coach, visual feedback. Here we go. So take the weight over. See that I pull the shoulder blades back. Bend the bar. And only then go up. Yeah, so it's taking the weight over. No jerking. So back to the normal weight, normal bar. So none of this, because that's a jerk and that's asking for trouble, right? Leaning into the heels, slightly back, as if you feel you're falling backwards in that upper upright position. Going down, squeeze into the bar, take the weight over, lean onto the heels, and up. If you look at my toes, you see I'll literally pull them up a little bit. That's why I'm wearing my shoes. There's the next reason. I'll go back into that later on. So, side angle again. Then, bar path. She didn't left it sideways. For the bar path, you want to have the bar above the shoelaces, or above the bridge of your foot. You can imagine the further away the bar is, the more of a lever I've got, which puts a lot more pressure on the lower back and makes the movement uh, a lot less efficient and a higher risk of injury. So rather, at the bar, above the shoelaces, 
and four ball should be pretty much pretty much in a straight line. There will be slight deviations. As long as you're not putting it towards you and then trying to uh, put it back forward. Starting point though, shoulders are over the bar, close to above the toes, or even further, also depending on the type of deadlift that you do. Body angle, uh, which you often see as well, the people will extend the knees first, which is good. But then the hips go up first, which also means uh, as a result, more of a lever effect on the lower back. Less efficient as I've just mentioned. So you want to think of keeping the upper body angle stable until it's time to push the hips forward. So none of this, but an hips forward. So extend the knees, so the bar gets to the Bar gets to the knees and then push the hips forward. Mechanically more efficient, safer, less strain on the lower back once again. So you can hold uh, the brace better and be more efficient with your lift. So that's the bar path, uh, knees, then hips, body angle, and then the order of movements. And this is still just first lift. I remember the first lift counts, it's number one. Because a lot of people will stand up and then start going. You should focus that the start of the movement is at the bottom. It's often not the case with other exercises like bench press and squats, so a little bit of a mindset tweak. But nonetheless, uh, extremely important. Right, then the following repetitions. With this, you want to have the, at the top, breathe, brace, and then push the hips back. You can visualize. Closing the door with the hips. So, controlled movement uh, and no rounding of the back or arching the back. We'll go to the neurological uh, drives a little bit later, neurological cues. But if you lie down flat on the floor, you will notice that you have a slight natural curve in the lower back. That slight natural curve you want to apply and have in place for about 99.9% .9 of all your deadlifts, as well as squats and other plank, uh, other exercises where planks are involved, like push-ups too. So that little S-curve should be there. No excessive arching and no rounding in the back, preferably. There are some options where you can do that, but then you use a lot less weight and it's uh, sport-specific. So in general, rather not. Um, that's a whole different discussion. So the final reps, uh, push the hips back. Um, the neurological drive with this one that's really important. Don't put it down, especially at the last set. A lot of people will do eight or 10 fantastic reps. And then the last one, they'll put it down. So they release the brace, round the back, ouch. Every millimeter counts. So you want to think as well as the further, the closer you get to the floor, the more you want to brace. Yeah, just don't fart. Uh, does that? It's getting really, really tough. Um, so push the hips back so the bar gets to the knees, and then you bend the knees. So you don't want to have the bar going around the knees or funny Janet Jackson wiggling stuff. And then uh, that's it. So now we're going to go to the neurological cues. This um, is a different way of approaching technique. And I've noticed that it helps a lot because with every exercise, every section of an exercise, there are 100 cues and it's always figuring out which cue lands with which person because it's different per person. The neurological cues though make a big difference. Like in the push-up, don't think of pushing up. Push, think of pushing the earth away, um, going down and push up as I explained in the full push up video with timestamps as well. Go have a look. Bring the elbow back and then push the earth away instead of um, going down and then pushing both different directions or what you will see with, with push up 
I need to go down, so they go down with the head and the shoulders. So neurological cues with the deadlift, heels into the ground. So don't try to go off the toes, get off the heels off the ground. And that's really important. And also here, push the earth away. So think of, in this position, drive the heels into the earth. Drive the earth, push the earth away. So, breathe. Brace. And you'll notice that you automatically keep a better contact and you're applying your force through your full system better without having shock absorbers and, and uh, energy leaks. Then, um, neurological cues to avoid. Yes, and this is quite important because a lot of people will think, I need to pull the bar up. But you don't have to pull. So you want to tighten the lats, upper back strong, uh, back extended strong, hips, uh, hamstrings, and a solid flowing movement. But you don't have to pull with the biceps. You can keep the arm long, keep, see them as cables with hooks. Not pulling, because that's how often uh, people get a tear in the bicep. You don't want to do that, especially when they start going heavy and it's not a habit. Once again, we're back to habits. So make sure that you keep your arms straight and it's not a pull. So neurologically, you've got cables with hooks. Also with switch grip. And then the other one, as I've mentioned, is putting the bar down. All perfect going up, and then no breathing, no bracing, no back. They go down, and that's a heightened risk of injury as well. Right, uh, we're going to go to the external keys now. Right, so now it's time to go on with the external cues and biofeedback. What I have discussed earlier on with the natural S curve in the lower back is that. Whilst you're deadlifting as well, so when you're squatting, you want to make sure that you've got a solid plank going on. Um, that often gets butchered. So one way that I use with a lot of my clients, I've lost myself every now to check that my form is still good. Direct biofeedback, BBC pipe, piece of stick, something solid, not too bendable. Um, hold that in place. As I've explained at the beginning of the video, when you lie down, you've got a natural little hollow section where you can have your fingertips go through. Contact points by the tailbone and between the shoulder blades, if you want to be really strict, but you want to keep your head chin in and not go too far up. If you want to be really strict, have the stick go to your head so you can't do that. But two points you don't want to lose during your training, and that's simple, small, definitely worth it. 
core is good, the risk of injury reduces a lot. You can think about it if you're not focused, you're exhausted, you're tired, um, whatever. But if your form is not good, but the power is still there, that you have a risk of injury. If your form is good and it's too heavy for you, you just won't be able to lift it. So the risk of injury reduces greatly. Right? So that's the UC puck. Then sport tape is also a very simple, uh, non observant manner. You can take sport tape, wash your physio, or buy it at a health shop. Um, and basically, you want to tape it standing upright, tape it from the upper back to the tailbone, and then you'll notice tension increase if you round your back slightly. A different way uh, to do practice. A different neurological cue, uh, which helps with external cues, is you extend the knees up and then push the hips forward. And for that, you can use less bands, put it around. I've got this nifty little strap, my SM belt. And for this, so I get close to the bar. Automatically pull onto the heels as discussed earlier and push the hips forward. Because I've got this pressure going on, I'm going to make sure that I do not round the back. So it's uh, direct biofeedback to make sure that my movement is more efficient. Right, so then we have the belts. It's a reminder that you want to have your brace strong and proper. And these belts, I know a lot of people say it's a way of cheating. Sure, you can go very far without cheat, uh, without, without cheating. Yeah, never cheat. Um, you can go very far without extra grip, strength, magnesium, but if it helps your training, it makes you focus more, reduce your risk of injury, I think it's a good, go. uh, good reason to go. But don't go this early when you're going for a max. When, you are, when you're on your way too heavier, you want to get used to it, otherwise it distracts you. Nice and tight, and this helps you brace a lot more. Different types of belts. Uh, this one is more used for Olympic lifts because you've got a little bit more range of motion because it's a little bit thinner. And for the more power variation, you've got the thicker and wider section all around. So it's even more brace all around. But these things also help you remember as an external cue to brace max. Otherwise, it doesn't look comfortable. If you don't brace something, they don't feel that nice. Right, we're going to go into warm up tips. Besides a, an array of proper warm ups, warm -ups that, I'll, uh, that I'll continue to add into uh, Instagram, Facebook, and soon a lot more for YouTube. Um, a couple of things. Is for instance the kettlebell swing, but not the arm one. I want you to think of exploding with the hips, and that makes pushing exploding with the hips forward, pushing the hips forward makes the shoulders up due to the solid brace. Once again, if your technique is not good with the kettlebell swing, have it checked, and for that, you can visualize that the elbow is stuck to the ribs and automatically have a better form if that doesn't work as well as it should you can actually literally take less pain tuck your elbow in and have it stuck so you can't move the elbows fantastic really good for it um, then let's get a boss swing for a warm up then a nice one that I got from the man Dean Somerset Dean is uh, an expert in, in mobility work, stabilizing, uh, and just all around great guy. From Canada. From Canada, just a lovely guy. So with this one, push the hips back, bring the hands towards the knees, and push the hips forward, activating the lats properly, back extenders, and you get the feel for where you want to be going. It's a nice way to activate the system, to get used to the movement, and to get focused on 
when we were at hand. Right, then let's cut the warm up clips, shoes. You see, you notice that I'm on socks, preferably barefoot, uh, preferably on hard, solid ground for the force, optimal force and extra stability. Softer shoes, less stability, less. It's actually a energy piece, so the movement will be less efficient uh, energy wise. Um, you have lifter shoes, which have a slight height increase that depends on ankle mobility, which is generally more applicable for Olympic lifts and squats, but could be used for some people in deadlift. Plus, they have a wooden plank in the knee, so it's uh, a lot less energy loss and a lot more stability. The soft running shoes or, or parkour shoes like these, rather not. And a simplistic crossfit shoe is a nice mix because it's uh, nice and tight. Not a slight height, but not too much, but quite solid whilst you still have freedom in your toes for jogging. So, different shoes, different goals. Do you think about it? For deadlift, it's not as important as a said, as you progress, it might be. Pretty damn useful. Right, let's get into the different variations. Now, as you can see, the catch ball swing actually is a variation. What I'm basically going to do today is the conventional. The conventional, you'll see the hips going slightly down. So that's conventional. Then you've got the sumo. That's the feet. A lot wider at the bottom part. One has the knees basically above the ankles. Hands go in through the knees. Sumo wrestling style. A whole discussion on which is uh, better for competitions, but that's a whole different discussion. I'm not going to get into that. I think the most work, the one who can pick up the most weight in a deadlift position, whatever deadlift position, wins, right? It's complicated. Right. Uh, so that's a lot of wide stance, it doesn't look comfortable for everyone, but you can get used to it, and at some point you might notice that that becomes your favorite. But then you've got the conventional, the Olympic, the hips go a lot lower. So you've got Olympic, conventional, and then the remaining, not personal, personal. Very loud flavor. So the hips start a lot higher. There's a slightly more emphasis on the hamstrings, glutes, and lower back because of the uh, more stretch activation than in the lower position. So for hypertrophy, building muscle, this is sort of better, as well as the stiff legged, which you basically. Keep the knees locked. Not a preference for me personally because it's a lot of strain on the knee joints. And then I need to get something quick. Magic. So the depth pivot. For this one, you do not want to start on top. You can use two plates, one plate, depends on how advanced you are or in the beginning. Important tip I would want to give you though is start at the bottom and a lot lighter because you go a lot further and then step on your platform and there you go <laughs> then the other deadlift variations are the snatch deadlift now the snatch deadlift as well as the Deficit deadlift means that you'll have to go lower. So also for this, but the snatch deadlift to go with the hands a lot wider. And another one, which I have a personal preference for when starting with new people, new clients. Uh, as well as young and old, doesn't really matter. It's a single leg that is great for balance, getting the posterior chain. Keep 
keeping the hips straight, see your smooth movement, the balance is a thing, you can use something for extra stability. That's pretty much it. Obviously there is a lot more detail to explain, but I think this is enough. Let me know what you think. And last but not least, when you're done with your set, take a small weight, run it under, take the one weight off, take the weight off, and on the other side, take the clip, up, and away. If you have any questions or comments, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. And uh, go deadlift.